Grand Rising, my friends. Welcome back if this is your first time or if you've been with me before as we do a deep dive on the secret history of the world and the mysteries that that entails. And that is kind of like the, 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 the crux of all of this at the end of it is, is that, you know, everything is not so unpredictable in this world that we have, that we can kind of have an idea of what to do next. And from that, we can hopefully make money or be able to better take care of our families because I've planned and I see for myself generate, uh, generating generational wealth. And I think everybody has that opportunity. Now, the difference is everyone has that opportunity, but does everyone take that opportunity? And that becomes where you have the differences. SEE Chair pleads for power to protect crypto investors and in volatile sector. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler has called for legislation focused on crypto trading, lending, and DeFi, DeFi platforms, saying investors are vulnerable in a fast-growing and volatile sector. In a letter to Senator Elizabeth Warren, who I used to love Senator Warren, and, and look, I'm not going to say I don't. Um, and even by love, I mean, I, I really respected how she approached it seeing politics when she came in initially, you know, I think around 2008, around that time. Um, but I don't know if it's just with crypto, but I have some some disagreements with uh, uh, Elizabeth about some of these things. One of the most outspoken crypto critics, Gensler Warren, right now I believe investors using these platforms are not adequately protected. Unlike other trade markets where investors go through an intermediary, people can trade on crypto trading platforms without a broker. Who needs a broker? Do we need you need your hand held as you're going to go about things in life? You know, do they do they uh, this is not a communist society. We don't hold hands to go pick a job to pick what uh, if if you even going to go to school or not um, after high school, uh, continuing your education you can trade on a platform without a broker 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're, oh, they're free. They're free from around the globe. He wrote in a letter which he sent August 5th Warren office release Wednesday. I don't know why. And, and, and this is just what she wants to hear. Elizabeth just love hearing this right now. I believe we need additional authorities to prevent transactions, products and platforms from falling between regulatory cracks. We also need more resources to protect investors to protect. We need to protect the investors. The investors need to be protected at all times. In other words, <laughs> hey, they, you know who also protects you know who also protects the, um, uh, I'm like, look, I'm, I'm trying to just go through life and bless my can, not upset people, but let's just get it out there. The mob protects, the mafia come and protect, they protect the, the shop owners and the, and the storekeepers from all these bad things that can occur out here for you. <sighs> in this growing and volatile sector. Now, Gensler was a guy that he taught blockchain, was a, is a big proponent. Maybe he sees this, and, and, and look, it may be the, the game I play. Tell them what they want to hear, get it in, let's get all the regulation in so that we can get these ETF passed and crypto can just, uh, the moon I'm talking about, we about to be dancing across a, a, a light fantastic amongst the stars. So, so let's let's move on. Let's move on. Let's move, move. Let's 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 travel further along this path and see see where it takes us. So I guess in terms of and this is what he's going to talk about like uh, exchanges, platforms, and 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 make the case of why the SEC, which is securities, need to be involved. But he also argued that. The probability is quite remote that with 50 or 100 tokens, any given platform has zero securities. I believe we have a crypto market now where many tokens have unregistered securities without required disclosures or market oversight. 
Also, it offered a critical view of stable coins, tokens pegged to value of fiat currencies, saying these. And if you don't know what fiat currency mean, fiat mean uh, fiat is built upon the strength and the confidence you have in that uh, country's or whatever governing body who's issuing it um, ability to back up its ability. So for the United States, for example, our fiat currency, the United States dollar is backed by how well you think, how strong you think America is. And I know that sounds crazy. Like, no, it's built upon. You got to remember, this is reality. Reality that all of these rules are made up. You know, like my man with, we, with uh, Thor told them in uh, Endgame that they had to go to um, Nevedalir. Nevedalir. Um I may be butchering that, but hey, you know, he said, that's a made up word. He said, all words are made up. And that, and that's what it is. All of this is made up. And we and we hope somehow with some, it's going to be fairly ran, fairly ran by the system. But in reality, um, it's all made up. And, and whoever has made up is going to try to use it to their advantage. Believe that at all times, you know. So uh, just talking about his letter came in response to Warren's inquiry into the sufficiency of the Security Exchange Commission's authority to regulate crypto platforms. Warren recently argued that the Financial Stability Oversight Council led by Treasury Secretary, Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, and which includes Gensler in his role as the head of the SEC, should take the lead in developing a regulatory framework for crypto instead of following the status quo of poorly coordinated responses from different federal agencies. And look, I agree. Let's let's get this out the way so that we can move on, which is boom, 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 going to be Bitcoin ETFs. And what is an ETF? If if we if I've, I've said that term, you're not 100 percent. ETF is an exchange traded fund, meaning this has been thoroughly vetted by the Security Exchange Committees that this asset can be traded on uh, publicly traded funds, which they protect with it all of their regulatory capacities i'm not gonna continue to like look there, there has to be i like the rules of the road that's why you know i tell people people always in um jobs i've had in life and careers that you, there are there's a reason for rules otherwise you know it'd be chaos out here but just be fair I, i'm all like i said i'm all about fairness and you know, um, be a consistent at how you apply those rules. But an ETF is an exchange traded fund, which will say Bitcoin, you know, however it is now, say 45,000, um, 46, 47,000, 48,000 uh, recently. Uh, let's just say 50. Round, easy round number. You know, future be 100, 500,000, a million. But let's just say 50 for the moment um, that everybody, you know, that's 50. You you can uh, more than likely a lot of these um, funds going to have to buy physical Bitcoin. When you say physical Bitcoin, you're not saying they're not buying a um, numbers on a screen that says they have a stake in someone else's Bitcoin. They'll be buying Bitcoin, putting it into their own storage. And we'll talk about that in the future the difference between. Um, hot storage, whereas, you know, on the Internet, cold storage, whereas you've taken your Bitcoin, the code of your piece of the protocol, and it's off of physical Internet. And it only can be accessed by individuals or, you know, way you have to set up to where it knows the, the your um, your private key. But we'll come back because I'll be all day if I go into any of that now. Um, but so a lot of these companies are applying for ETFs. Invesco, which is a very large company with 1.5 trillion worth of assets under management, um, is is you know has filed for an ETF, and it's literally dozens, dozens more. said more than a dozen. I think it's probably close, probably more than 20 at this point. Maybe more. I don't even know. I know uh, Grayscale. Uh, wants to turn their trust into an ETF. Here you see that um, Krypton, Krypton files for an Ether. So they're trying to go with Ethereum to make an ETF. Van Eck 
has filed even previously unsuccessfully attempted to launch a fund with the SEC in 2017. Now they're filing for a prospectus for a uh, Bitcoin strategy extracted change of fund with exposure to Bitcoin futures and other investment vehicles. So there's a lot of big institutional money, as we previously discussed, who are looking to get into this space. A lot of money in the space, and it's going to be and that and, and and so the point. I don't know if I was clear about that yesterday with game theory is that. Once these big companies start competing for this finite supply, it's going is it's, it's supply and demand. It's going to force the price to be astronomical to where the game will be over time to be who has Bitcoin. And it comes from being and that's the difference from gold. Gold can be mined. Gold can be used in other ways. But Bitcoin is a pure financial vehicle. kind of changing um, topics, but at the same time, it all is intertwined because money makes this world tick and the love of it is the root of evil. So understand that money is a necessary tool to be used. A lot of this is energy and Bitcoin is a fantastic battery source to collect energy and 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 transfer uh, uh, energy. And so part of that energy is used for war. Unfortunately, I mean, imagine how far we would be as a people. And by people, I mean humanity as people, as a, as, as, as a species, if we were harmonious, if we didn't fight each other, if we all this money spent, because all all the money that has been made, the vast majority of money being made and being collected in this energy, you know, the work and labor and managing of the supervision and coordination is used for defense, which is violence. You know, the the thought that. We have to create these um, creations, create these creations. We have to create these vehicles like this aircraft carrier or the submarines uh, to to potentially ward off a threat of someone. So it's all silliness. But Chinese submarines may have stalked a British aircraft carrier in a display of military strength in the contested South China Sea. Though China claims the ships may have revealed themselves purpose, pur purposely, purposely, yeah, according to reports, the Royal Navy aircraft carrier HMS Queen Elizabeth was followed by two Chinese Shang. Oh wait, um, now uh, the he he was uh, trying to pronounce it. You, you know, if you I don't know if you if you guys have seen the trailer for the new Marvel movie Shang Shang Chi Shang Chinese Shang class. I may be butchering that. Submarines armed with cruise missiles, the British Daily Express reported this week. The submarines were detected by sonar operators on the HMS Kent and the HMS Richmond as the carrier group moved into the Pacific Ocean from the South China Sea, the paper reported. Now, China is saying that um, And we'll discuss this a little bit, bit later. So China, you know, they claim that that we talked about that before, that uh, they're trying to expand. The West will say they're trying to, and other countries in, in the Asian Pacific Rim will say they're, they're trying to expand their territory that is not theirs. China said it is theirs. You know, do I have I done a deep enough dive to look at the all the ancient maps and what treaties have been signed to see where everybody point is no i'm not going to uh, say that so i just i would just say that that's what both sides are, are are claiming right now um beijing is using technology to locate our positions but are deploying submarines to re reinforce their wider intent to move towards superpower status and dominate trade and security across the pacific contrary to international law an unnamed naval officer told the paper but china is disputing it of course and they're saying that um, 
the British ships have limited anti-submarine capabilities and are trying to belittle China by claiming to have detected their submarines. And this is now from um, Chinese. One unnamed expert cited by the Global Times. And I was going to say the Global Times. Okay, here. Global Times, an English language paper controlled by the Chinese Communist Party, responded with a report citing Chinese military experts who say the express count is not credible. One of the main experts cited by the Global Times said, however, that submarines don't need to be near a warship to launch long range strike, while another suggested that Chinese revealed their positions as a warning and were using the British vessels as an imaginary <laughs> target for practice. And, I, you know, it's probably a little bit of truth for both in the sense where uh, the Chinese were uh, following the, the, the British carrier and were detected, but they were also, you know, not trying to not get detected in the sense where they were just more of getting a sense of what their capabilities was and compared to the British ships. Because when was the last time a British carrier was in the South China Sea and Chinese subs were able to get in position to track it and get locks on their uh, weaponry? And I'm not sure if they were getting locks on their weaponry or not, but. Now, this is a little bit more scary, though. Russia suspected if you live in the United States and you, you know, you have a bias in the United States of being always in charge. <laughs> Russia suspected of faking U.S. warship locations on GPS. Between August 2020 and July 2021, dozens of instances were identified in which the locations of U.S. and NATO warships appear to have been spoofed close to Russia in other provocative positions, according to a new analysis. And Russia is a suspected culprit. The analysis released July 29th was conducted by the nonprofit Sky Truth and Global Fishing Watch, and it compared GPS-based auto, automatic identification system I, AIS tracking location of warships to their actual position as seen in satellite imagery. The study found 100 naval vessels with suspected false AIS tracks identified between August 27th, 2020 and July 15th, 2021. In one instance, an apparent AIS track showed USS Roosevelt in Arle. I'm butchering that. I've heard the name. Arle. Arle is an Arle Burke class guided missile destroyer sailing four miles inside Russian territorial waters in the Baltic Sea. So, if you're not too familiar with why this is important, is that Every country, and I want to say it's 12 miles, has a imaginary line drawn in the ocean. I want to say, I think it's, a 12, it's 12 miles, which is their territorial waters. Now, it's, it, it gets to some weird things about 12 versus 200. And I think it's some arguments about where we fly our planes. I have to, uh, you know, when, when I do a deeper dive into um, more international relations, I'll, I'll have all that information 100%. Because it's, it's you know it's, it's the same way where you know Richard Branson and Jeff Bezos went into space, and they argue about what is the true definition of space, <laughs> and it's like you know five to seven miles different. So, like I said, it's like most things. It's it's it's, it's, it's all made up stuff anyway. Uh, the but what's important here is that you know. The, this is internationally recognized, like the 12 miles offshore. And if you're if the, if any country is able to show that another country is in their territorial waters, they can fire on them kind of almost as like, look, what did you expect us to do? And yeah, the other country can respond, but they really don't have a justification to. In, in seen in the international eyes of their response for the most part. So. Like I said, it gets weird where some, you know, we'll be like 14 miles offshore and, and you know, then someone will, or, you know, China to bump, bump our plane with their plane. Like, hey, no, you guys are closer. But this appears that there are, Russia has the ability to fool the GPS system. So as we talked previously about of why are we developing 
a, a bunch of drones that can potentially act as a local GPS net, you know, that, that you know, probably be different to, to spoof because, you know, when you spoof this, you're talking about spoofing satellites. Um, and, and that becomes important to have those abilities. And that's what we're going to do from international news today. Now we're going to get back to fixing ourselves. How magic mushroom ingredient psilocybin helps patients with depression or PTSD change how they feel by rewiring their brains with more connections. And the long and short of this is that stress, which is mediated by uh, a lot of different chemicals like glutamate, um, can, can hurt the brain can damage your brain, it's toxic to the brain. And we also know that the bad experiences develop pathways, like your reactions to bad experiences, how you react to similar experiences that give you triggers or reminders of that are built up in these pathways that remember I've now been damaged by um, these toxic chemicals that are created by these bad experiences, but also the these pathways are, have developed. And so that's what people who have trauma are dealing with. And we find that this, the psychedelics and other substances can start to heal a lot of this, um, these pathways and rewrite. So, and, and rewrite is not even a, the, the better word. The word is you have to write new connections. You have to form new connections that are more powerful than the old connections. And that's how you get over trauma. You have to, and that's what therapy and medications help with, is how to create new pathways that are more powerful. Psilocybin, uh, ketamine, probably DMT, LSD, these medications, medications, we call them psychedelics, for years, they've been um, beyond marginalized, uh, ostracized, uh, demonized, which, you know, it kind of pushes back a long way. But in, 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 we'll have a discussion about that at some point. Why would, when you know potentially have the ability to help and you see it, why would you want to demonize it and stop most people from having access to it? You know, who gains from that? I'll leave you with that mystery. The some people already have a, 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 a great clue. Same, you know, I read a lot, so that's where I get a lot of these things that you'll see um, that will pop out of my head at times. The so let, so let's jump in. So, but anyway, these are able to help you heal and rewrite stronger. Um, neuronal connections that are more powerful than those trauma connections that were causing so much uh, conflict in an individual's life. The use of psychedelic drugs such as LSD and psilocybin were a legitimate field of medical research in the 1940s and 50s, and LSD was even employed as a psychiatric medication, but such research stopped in the mid-1960s when they were declared Schedule I illegal drugs in the United States, the Great Drug War, you know. Why would they do that? Why the opening up that is a talk for another time. I would we would that would be another two hour discussion. I don't even know if we'll do it that long when we do it then. But over the past decade, researchers have studied, have returned studying the therapeutic uses of psychedelics to treat depression and post traumatic stress disorder. Research, fresh research suggests that psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, can be a treatment for depression. Talked about how humans have been using magic mushrooms for thousands of years and indigenous societies have long used them in rituals. And that's another long discussion. How have psychedelics shaped the religious and civilization, the, the religious experiences and the creation of civilization among humans, sapiens. Talked about and called visual hallucinations, but the most important part of their effect for those of us who are looking at their therapeutic use is also in heightened 
people's emotions. Let's go. Here we go. What happens next is the most interesting part. Such bindings do happen naturally, but with psilocybin, many, many more connections are made. The brain effectively rewires itself by adding a lot more quote unquote wires. And these new connections enable the different parts of the brain to work in different ways. And that's another the thought about is that, you know, part of depression, when I say you get these um, this damage to a lot of the part of the brain through these uh, excess of these chemicals that are toxic to the brain. And then you have these formations of, of, of connections that are uh, maladaptive. They don't, they're not helpful to um, the goal. And the goal, I think, of every human being is to be content. Happy is a relative term, but to be content. Um, and so this takes away our ability to be content and to be um, present in and grateful for what we are in at the moment. Um, these, you get stuck in pathways. So you get stuck in dealing with things the same way, but rigidity and rigidity becomes a problem. It's, oh, everything is going to always turn out this way, or this is how I have to always respond to every situation. And by using substance, you open up um, and heal those pathways where you'd be like, oh, wait, there's different ways. Everything ain't always going to be this way. You start instead of everything being more being black and white, you see more gray, shades of gray. And I think that's most one of the most important things to understand that if you start to see things like black and white, you're doing it wrong. You know, there's always a possibility and you always got to look for, you know, um, we call it devil's advocate in the game conversations. It was a term in um, the Jedi lore. I'm butchering. I want it is like terror, terror, something. I forget the name of it now, but um is it is, is whenever you think you know something so certain, then play that game with yourself. What if I'm wrong? What what would I need to look for? What would I see? You know, how do I argue the other side and and try to under really understand? Have have compassion for the other the other side. Like I really want them to win. I really want to be defeated in my idea. What what do I have to understand to defeat this idea? And sometimes you find things like, oh, wow, I was wrong about something. I found something that, I, you know, I, I learned new. Or you'd be like, wow, <sighs> you know, that idea is unassailable. I, I, I can't think of how to figure a way to, to argue against it that's, that would make sense, you know, without being just jumping into complete um, a state of, of unreality. Psilocybin makes areas of the brain that don't usually connect with each other start connecting. And that means, for instance, your visual field can connect with your emotions, says Gillibardi. And along the same lines, we talk about now we understand how ketamine and, and from this, they're just talking about how they understand now ketamine is able to rapid, rapidly uh, modulate glutamate in the brain. And they want to know if they can separate that ability. Some scientists think ketamine's therapeutic power relies on its influence over glutamate, a neurotransmitter that's secreted by the end of certain neurons in the brain. Now, some levels with glutamate as high as is, is very known to be uh, neurotoxic, uh, 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 toxic to the neurons. And so, but other areas, glutamate is low and you need it to be raised. And that's what the brain is really, is more of a symphony where there's part is is no all or none with it. There's some parts where dopamine is too high and some parts where it's too low. Same with serotonin. And that's why it's sometimes difficult because some of these agents we use are more shotgun approach and they're, they're going to go do all or none for some, some things. And so getting to the point where we can fine tune um, to, to the region that needs with the modulation, that's why I like to use the term instead of raising or lowering and modulate because it depends on where I'm at, which what I need to do. But ketamine is has been found um, to really reduce. The, um, here it talks about yeah, it can uh, almost instantly alleviate depressive symptoms and suicidal ideation in individuals. Uh, you know. I guess I probably at some point talk about what we call this grand rising rounds. Maybe I'll do that tomorrow. Uh, it's for tomorrow's where I'll say why is rounds. So it's just morning rounds. And when we prescribe and do this and that, uh, 
but ketamine is going to be, a, it is, and it's going to be a very, very helpful agent to um, get people moving in the right direction. The same thing, we get the healing brains, resetting um, patterns, stuck patterns of, uh, of negative programming in individuals. It's all about, a lot of it, it has to do with the environment, and that's why they talk about here, um, because here they're talking about using intranasal, uh, intranasal ketamine. Um, so it's a little spray you can use. And it's all about setting up the environment that you're going to be in. Um, here they're talking about, you, you know, it needs to, it, it's a psychoactive drug that can cause feelings of fatigue, restlessness, anxiety, dizziness, hallucinations, all of which make it a tricky treatment to control clinically. And a lot of it is just education. It, it, it's, it's not just, you know, for anything anything even you know and i'm a very huge proponent of the stimulant medications for individuals that have true core adhd symptoms but for anything is the the medicine is not going to be the be all end all it's not going to solve all your problems you know there has to be a a measure of behavioral change and environmental change as well and so for ketamine, if you're going to use it at home, if you get it prescribed, you have to set up an environment almost like a ritual in a sense where you, you know, be a soft music or a music that's going to put you in a positive. Everything has to make you feel where you want to be in the future. And that's going to be in a positive, energized, loving, selfless state. So the environment when you use that for that period when you're going to be going through that process, that's what you want to set up. You know, if you're using hypnosis, these are the things that you want to, to um, engage in your subconscious to start um, running as a baseline program all day long. You know, and you can learn to do it to yourself. I think over years that I've worked on trying to, um, for my upbringing, push myself to be way greater than anything could have been expected. And what is that? Emotional resiliency. How do you cultivate that? This is a very good author by, I don't want to butcher her name, I'm sorry, but Gupreet Kaur, um, Kaur. Uh, how to gain control. You gain control of your life. You don't let anger and frustration phase you. One of my, um, I, may, I may say it a million times on here to so get used to it, my, one of my favorite expressions is the old Chinese uh, proverb, do not be moved by the wind of another spirit. And that means that if I come in, you know, I tell people, you know, when I'm talking to them, like if I come in the room yelling at you like, ah, you have a choice. You can sit there and respond back to me the way you feel like, oh, yeah, what, what, what? I'm going to get right back, I'm get right back with you. Or you can let that wash over you and be like, oh, this person has a problem. I don't, don't know why they're so angry about when they get me involved with this. And that's, and that's important. You know, you have to, have to have that control over your own. Don't let their spirit, um, their wind or their spirit get to moving yours around. You have to, you know, your spirit has to be, has a shield around it. We probably can talk about meditation and developing that, you know, energetic body and, and the macabre and controlling the phases of, 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 you know, reality around yourself as well. We can do a talk about that as well at some point. I do have a bunch of different, like, um, subsets that I, I, we, can, we can drop and discuss and move forward with it. You don't try to please others, become independent, free and unworried. You see mistakes as opportunities to learn and grow. I had a... I have a poster that has the word mistakes with a line through it and say lessons. Because that's what it is. You learn from it. Communicate effectively. You make sure that people understand you. You don't just, say, just speak just to get the words out. You want to know that people understand your deep structure, which is that level where it's, be, it's pre-thought. Of what, or before it even comes into your ability to formulate thought, let alone words, you want people to understand uh, where you're at. You become happier. And building an uh, emotional resistance, I'll, I'll read this because I'll, we'll finish with this. I think it was a, a really good summarization, a summarization of how to get there. <clears throat> and she said, when I first start working with clients, I help them define what happiness means to them. 
And, and remember, you know, happiness is just being content. You're not going to be happy all the time. That's not realistic. And then we come up with some measurable objectives to reach that goal. Having them journal about their feelings is a good start. If you wear your emotions on your sleeve or fly off at the handle too often, you have a lot of suppressed emotions that require your attention. These suppressed emotions become emotional triggers that initiate an unconscious emotional response to the stimuli present in your environment. And that is, you know, I love it because, you know, I just, but a lot of it is uh, our psycho, psycho language to each other. In other words, whenever you find you, you, you're irritable and you, you know, it's hard to, um, to control your your own spirit and, and people and you feel like there's someone in your life or other people in your life. It could be strangers, it could be a spouse, it could be a um, a child. If you feel like, oh, that person can push my buttons. No, that's you. You, you. you have buttons that are stuck or greasy or blinking red that, you know, they keep bumping into, but they're they're sticking out. Those are your buttons that you have to fix. So work on yourself first. And there should be nobody who should be able to make you apply off a handle. You know, if, if, if that issue be only in a sense of um, physical violence or institutional uh, um, betrayal that, that, you know, that should have those responses. But, uh, you know, and like I said, there's some things that's going to push it. But, you know, interactions for the most part, interpersonal interactions, it should be super rare that any of these happen. And none of us are perfect. You know, we strive to do, to be this point. So we work for this. So this is what you want to see yourself working to. If you want to change your reactivity, start by paying attention to your emotions. The main emotions that promote lack of resilience include anger, guilt, sadness, or depression, anxiety, or fear, and humiliation. And, you know, everybody, you know, a lot of people I'll say, um, in order, I, you know, I used to, when the people I tell, like, you can't just say to somebody, are you depressed? And they say, no. And we're like, move on. <laughs> like, you know, you got to be like, what does depression mean for them? What does anxiety mean for them? They may not even understand your interpretation of that word. So you can see somebody who looks sad, but like, do you get sad? Do you, you know, you, do you feel like, you, do you feel helpless? Like your, your, your existence is not going to change? Do you feel hopeless? These hard to cope with negative emotions hijack your peace and joy. Write about incidents and situations when you overreacted. Look for the victim mindset thoughts that allow you to make excuses or blame other things and people. Once you're aware of your emotions, observe them with compassion and empathy as much as possible. Accepting yourself just the way you are is the backbone of emotional resilience. Pretty much all psychological and emotional issues rise out of low self-esteem. And I agree wholeheartedly. First thing I tell people and talk about is love yourself. And I know that's hard. It's easy to say. It's hard to do. Especially when you've been through rough things in this world where you feel like, you know, you're not worthy of that love. But you are. Of course you are. You know, I used to, I used to ask people, do you, you kill children? You, you sell drugs to old people? You know, I used to ask this to kids, and they think they were bad. And then uh, they were like, no, I don't do that. I'd be like, exactly. So anything else, more than likely, you can be forgiven. And even for those things, you probably can be forgiven for that as well. If, it's, if you seek true forgiveness and really want to change your life, there's almost nothing. I can't think of almost anything. I mean, I'm probably thinking of some things, but give me enough time. But not even, look, I've at, at the time in, in life, I have to show compassion to murderers, pedophiles, uh, racist. I've had to put my arm around them and tell them it was going to be okay. And they cried on my shoulder. And so, you know, and, and, and if you told me that when I was a younger man, I wouldn't have believed you. I don't thought like, no, no, no. You know, somebody did that to a kid. No, no, no. But as you get older and you, and you, your, your, your perspective, your worldview change and your understanding of the universe and your place in it and your place in it. And, you know, you, you feel the, the gratitude of God, what God has given you. It, it, it's a powerful thing. Let, let go off on my, on my tangent. I apologize. They start with judgment and comparison. Most of the time we label ourselves as our emotions. For example, I am depressed. Although it's a correct way of expressing what you feel, it translates to I am not in control and good enough. Instead of saying I feel depressed, instead say I feel depressed, not I am. Right? Because I am is I am. And you are 
a a child of the of the creator of the, of the you are a child of the creator of the universe you are a child of the most high you are a design of the grand architect you may feel these things but they are not you creating this distance from your emotions help you see yourself more as a human than a robot that must always be in control being able to have compassion and empathy towards yourself means self-love and self-love is at the base of emotional resilience because being able to have a total unconditional positive regard for yourself promotes emotional wellness, spirituality and self-actualization overall. Yeah, she she did a great job. I love I love that um, of kind of putting it all tying it together and. You know, this is something we'll definitely kind of harp on over time is the importance of um, emotional and spiritual and physical resilience. It's, it's you know, financial resilience as well. And that's a big thing on this channel would be resilience on all aspects. And you, all of us are capable of it because I love you. You love yourself. God loves you. God loves us. And that's all that matters.